Okay, I'm gonna get started. I think it's my time to go. So my question is, when you have an enterprise company with, with over 100,000 people around the world using open source to create all kinds of things, how do you help them do it right and do it well? Well, the answer is by having an open source programs office. It's called an OSPO for short, and it provides the guardrails, the expertise and support that everyone needs in order to use open source in all the ways that they do in these large companies. So today I wanna thank you for joining my talk about a career in an OSPO, in an open source programs office. Um, these organizations, you'll usually find them in enterprises and they provide lots of career opportunities. And I'm gonna cover that today as well as give you some tips and tricks for how you can start a career in an OSPO right after today's session. But before I dive into careers in OSPOs, I wanted to talk a little bit about my career and why I think open source programs offices are a great place to land. So many people think that open source is about the code. And while getting people to use your software is definitely an end goal, it takes much more than just technical skills to release great open source software. You need diverse groups sharing all kinds of skill sets and talents in order to actually deliver that software. So for example, you need tech writers who are gonna write documentation because that's what drives the adoption of your software. And you need people with core skills that know how to bring people together and unite a community, grow that community and get them to engage with each other. That means they need to not only have core skills, but they need to know how to run community events and mentor people that are new to the community. And they have to be able to facilitate forums and there's lots of other roles in open source. So whatever your background is, open source has a place for you. And I'm someone who has had a great career in open source and I haven't even contributed code, at least not much. So I wanted to give you just a little bit of a background of my own career, just so you can see uh, the ways that I've been able to make impact and perhaps it might speak to you. So I first started in sales, marketing, business development, and technology, working for all kinds of tech companies. And I really love business strategy. But then one day I took a left turn and I went into government. And I helped the state of New Jersey here in the US reinvent how they fund and um, deliver marketing and um, communications for public transit. And that meant I had to start working with communities and really doing lots of grassroots kind of work, different than what you would do normally in tech. And I really fell in love with that community work that I was doing, but I ultimately missed technology. So I wanted to find a career that combined tech and community management. And that's where I found open source. And specifically, that's where I found the Drupal Association, which is a nonprofit supporting the open source content management system project called Drupal. It was just in its early days and I started by doing all of their fundraising. I helped uh, sell their event sponsorships and I started to build membership programs and selling those. And eventually I got to use more of my business skills and became the COO where I could operationalize this foundation that was growing so that we could really scale our impact. And then eventually I became the executive director where I got to work with the board and the staff and the community to really make sure that we were doing the right programs to help the open source project and community thrive. And then from there, I said, well, I've been working with one project and going very deep in understanding how to run an open source project. And I wanted to kind of have that impact at scale. And that's why I joined Google. And now I am in the open source programs office running the strategy research and operations department. And I get to help our, our whole OSPO help tens of thousands of 
people at Google work on over 2000 projects. So I definitely have my work cut out for me. And I'll tell you that a career in open source is really exciting. It has a lot to offer, whatever your skill set is. Some of the things that I've gotten out of working in open source is career growth. You know, all you have to do is really like lean in and try different kinds of aspects within community work. And suddenly you start bu building new skills, which has really grown my career um, and all the skills and talents that I now have. I have had so much international travel because of open source. And I now have this wonderful network of friends and professionals around the world that I can call on. And I've built expertise and people want me to come to conferences now and speak. That is definitely a feather in my cap professionally, uh, something that you all can have. And then the other thing about open source is that it gives me this feeling of being part of something bigger than myself. And hopefully that's what everyone can get out of open source. I know I found that in Drupal for sure. And last but not least, open source is never a dull moment. And there's all kinds of things happening on any given day. So I encourage you to explore a career in open source for sure. Now let's dive in into OSPOs. And I'm gonna talk about it from the perspective of Google's open source programs office. But to understand what an OSPO is and why companies need one, we need to really understand how open source has grown so much and why OSPOs were created because of that growth. So in short, over the years, open source usage has grown in scale and complexity, especially in enterprises. You know, at first, companies adopted open source for their inherent benefits that you probably know about. Uh, you could create something faster and have, get to market faster because of it, and you could do it for less money because you're uh, bringing in free software that's really innovative and easy to apply to whatever you're trying to create. And that other benefit is the innovation of open source software. It attracts so many great people, and so you can really rely on the code that you're using to be more innovative in the solutions that you're building. And then lastly, people were choosing open source because of its security benefits. Just with so many people around the world looking at a code base, you're going to catch those bugs and vulnerabilities much faster. But then over the years, open source adoption started to really accelerate exponentially even, especially in enterprises. And that's because enterprises have really been embracing strategic initiatives like digital transformation and improving their customer experience. And to do that, they've been relying on cloud native and lots of data initiatives um, and of course, artificial intelligence. And all of these focus areas rely heavily on open source and it's really changed the way that companies are working and, and the tools that they're using, all the, um, on the different CI CD tools are open source like Jenkins. So there's just been a prolif proliferation of open source in enterprises. And Google really mirrors that story. It's really no different for us. We were built on open source from day one, really, both our infrastructure and our products. So we started by using Linux, right? Most companies start by just pulling in software that they can use and build off of. And then eventually we started to contribute back patches. That was all very manageable. And then over time, we started to build our own open source projects and releasing it and building products on top of that. And now today we are using open source absolutely at scale and it's very complex. So we use and release hundreds of millions of lines of code. We are in the top 10 contributors for the Linux kernel and Google contributes 1% of all of GitHub's code. That's a lot of code. And we make 250,000 commits every year on GitHub alone. And we use and contribute to over 2000 projects. So 
it is certainly um, a lot to manage. And as we are using open source in all these ways, and we're building the com company infrastructure with it and products, we are putting a lot behind these projects that we're releasing. Many of you know that I have really grown in scale and impact. Some of them include Android, which you know has really disrupted the mobile marketplace. And then Chromium has really had an impact on the browser market. Uh, TensorFlow, of course, for artificial intelligence. Go is a really interesting story. It's a language that we've been using internally, but it is growing even more so outside of Google. Uh, Docker and many other cloud native products are built with Go. And then of course, Kubernetes is something that we created and released, put into the Linux foundation. And now it has really um, been a market changer for cloud overall. And that takes, uh, to maintain the, those kinds of large communities just takes a lot of work. And it's important that we invest in these projects because the products rely on it. And the users, there's billions of users and they rely on this open source being feature-proofed to keep supporting the products that they're using. So using and creating this much open source means there's a lot of Googlers working on open source, and it's just a lot to track. Pulling in and pushing out this much open source, it's a risk. It's a risk to any company. And there's all kinds of risks. There are risks around the licenses that we're using. There's risks around the compatibilities and dependencies of the code that we're bringing in and pushing out. There's also reputational risks. Because when open source uh, requires people to work together, Google is going to be working with people outside of our organization, different organizations themselves, different people. And these communities that we're working in, they have certain norms. And we can't assume that they're going to work the way Googlers work. We need to really make sure that Googlers understand the open source way when contributing to a project and working with others. And also we're a big company. We don't wanna be that elephant stomping in the garden. We really need our Googlers to know the right way to interact with others. And if we don't, it's really gonna look bad for Google and people won't wanna work with us. And that's not good for the project. That's not good for Google. It's not for, good for the people that are trying to make an impact within the projects. So. That's another risk we um, keep an eye out for. And then of course there's business risks. So I talked about the products that are built on these projects. And we have billions of users relying on us to deliver. And it's really important that the projects that these products rely on like Android and Chromium and Kubernetes are sustainable. And so we need to make sure that we sustainably steward the projects that we're releasing where there's communities forming. Because if they aren't future-proofed, it's just, it's not good for Google. It's not good for the other companies that are relying on this software. And we really take it seriously that we're good citizens in the projects that we release. So these are various risks that we have to think about within Google or really any enterprise. And that's why we have an OSPO here at Google, is to mitigate those risks. But also, we're here to empower all the Googlers to make sure they can make an impact with open source and whatever that means to them. And we do this by offering a full suite of services to support them on their journey. So we provide business consulting. We help product managers decide if open source is the right strategy for them. And we help them build that strategy. And then for those pulling in code using other people's software, we create policies to make sure that they don't create legal risks and that they do it in a way that's respectful to those contributing to the project, those that created the project. And then for those Googlers who are creating software and releasing it out into the wild, we provide them guidelines so that they do it right and also stay in compliance. 
but we also build tools to help them do that faster, easier, and staying compliance, kind of giving them the guardrails. And then if a project that we release does have a community and ecosystem form around it, we have experts who can help build those communities and make sure they stay sustainable. And so that's a full suite of services that we offer. And it requires a lot of skill sets. And that's why OSPO can offer so many career paths for you. So things to think about or paths to consider are engineering. Engineers are building those tools that help Googlers be compliant and use and release software quickly and easily. And then we have people with legal backgrounds and compliance backgrounds creating our policies and making sure that we're adhering to them all the way across Google. And then we have uh, community strategists, community managers, and they're the ones that are making sure that whatever open source strategy is defined is actually realized. They know how to build community governance and they know how to attract on board and really nurture the community. Plus we've got community managers who work with those strategists to make sure that there are programs in place to make these projects sustainable so that we're stewarding sustainably. That means we have people that are running community events. Um, they're running mentor programs. Um, they're also running diversity initiatives, reward programs lots of different programs to make sure that we really onboard and nurture our community sustainably. And then last, we have my team, which is made up of strategists, researchers, and operations specialists. So the strategists make sure that we really understand what Google needs across all of our different divisions in terms of open source support. And then we make sure that we understand those needs internally and adjust our services accordingly. And then we have the researchers who create um, insights so we can make data-driven decisions as we're building out new services or adjusting services to meet everyone's needs across Google. Um, and then we have operational specialists who make sure all of our teams are working together to really deliver these services that we have efficiently, effectively, on budget, going through annual planning together. So it's, you know, it's a lot of different things that we do in OSPO. You have a lot of choices when you think about working in enterprise in an open source programs office. And now I, for one, am learning a ton by making the shift by working specifically in a project and then moving to an OSPO. And I've really found it to be an exciting part of my career. So I encourage you to check it out because there is probably something for everyone out there to explore. And Google is just one of the OSPOs out there. There's a lot and there's more coming every year. And that's because open source is just growing in adoption at so many companies. And they really need an OSPO to help track everything and make sure open source is being done well and right in their organization. And to find other OSPOs, I suggest that you check out the Linux Foundation's to-do group. It's a community of OSPOs. And so you can see here on the slide that there's a lot of well-known companies that have an OSPO already. And like I said, this group is growing every year. So I encourage you to check this out at todogroup.org. But that's you know, just one thing that you can do. If you're looking to have a career in an open source programs office, there's a couple steps that I recommend you take. You can learn more about Google's open source program office uh, at opensource.google. We've released all of our tips and tricks um, for running an OSPO. You can learn about the different programs that we have. And you can also follow our blog at Google OSS. We share lots of content about what we're doing in open source with all the projects we're releasing and contributing to, um, what we're doing that's new for um, supporting all of Google with OSPO services. 
And again, check out the to-do group. I think it's really great to explore all the different kinds of OSPOs out there. I've described what Google's OSPO looks like and the services we provide. And that may not be the same at other OSPOs. And that's because every company has different needs and they design their OSPO to address the needs of the day. And so what you have at Google may be different than what you have at Microsoft or Red Hat. And that's great. I also think that if you want to understand OSPOs, you should start following some of the women who helped create OSPOs and are leading them today. And I have a few uh, Twitter handles that you might want to follow. The first one's Denise Cooper at Diva Denise. So she started one of the first OSPOs, I don't know, 15, 20 years ago. I'm losing track of time. Um, VM Brosore is Vicky Brosore. She really wrote the book on OSPOs and contributing to open source, like literally wrote the book. She runs OSPOs today. Um, Stormy runs Microsoft's OSPO, and that's her handle is at Stormy. And Deb Bryant, uh, which is the last handle at Deb Bryant, she's running the OSPO at Red Hat today and has been in the industry making all kinds of impacts. These are some other women I highly recommend that you follow. They have so much to share, um, both in terms of OSPOs, open source, and careers in OSPO. And then lastly, I think it's really important to understand more about open source if you're gonna go down this path. And one of the best ways to do this is by attending industry events. Um, and so I, recommend you check out the Linux Foundation's Open Source Summit. It's a virtual event like this one, and it is also um, uh, let's see, it's like this one, it's at the end of the month, I'll be speaking there, lots of industry experts will be speaking there, and it's a great place to network. It'll have a lot of engagement just like they have here. So uh, check that out, and um, of course, there's lots of other ways to get started. Those are some that I thought would be the most pertinent, easiest to get started with. So I want to thank you for taking this time to attend this talk and to be interested in a career in open source. Like I've mentioned, there's a space for all talents and skills in open source and they need you and they want more women to join and they're making open source more and more welcoming and inclusive. And it's a great time to get involved. So I hope you do. And I hope you'll consider OSPO as a career path as well. And hopefully this short talk might have inspired you to get started today. Thank you so much. And if you have questions, I'll take them in the chat and also feel free to send me a tweet at Megan Sanicky. I'll be looking for any tweets and responding to them pretty quickly. So thank you. All right, and just looking here. So how do you apply for a job at OSPO? It's really going to each individual company, like the ones I mentioned that you could find at todogroup.org. Go there and do a search for jobs at the Open Source Programs Office. And that's usually the fastest way to find that. And of course, just going to any enterprise career site and typing in open source will help you start finding um, some of the different job openings that they have available today. And there is no um, job at Open OSPO, like there's no at OSPO job board that I know of. Um, so I would just say, you know, go to the different um, companies that have OSPOs and just do a search for open source. Um, and right now, you know, I think you'll find that there are some companies hiring today, some that have some things on hold. And it's definitely a challenging time, but everyone wants to help everyone in open source. And so I encourage you to go to the Linux Foundation's Open Source Summit. There's going to be lots of sessions on this, and I think that'd be a great place to get started as well. 
Okay. Well, I think that's time. I don't see any other questions coming in. So I am going to get ready to sign off. Although actually I'll wait. I see another question coming in. Does every Google office have an OSPO section? Uh, in Google, there's only one open source programs office and it serves all of Google. So that is how we're structured. Now, there are, we have within Google what we call a community of open source practitioners. So Chromium has a lot of services to support the Chromium business and same with Android as well. But we work um, with them and support them. But we also give direct support to lots of other projects like Go and um, and then also Kubernetes. I'm trying to think of some other ones. TensorFlow is another one that OSPO supports directly. And it, so it really depends um, on how each PA is supported differently and what they're going to fund um, in terms of supporting their open source initiatives. But they definitely rely on OSPO as a centralized service to help us make sure we're consistent and really efficient across all of Google when we're thinking about how to do open source. Okay, so I think that might be it for questions. And with that, I am going to leave you here and you can find me on Twitter at Megan Sanicky. Thank you so much for your time.